you. Okay, I want to do a little review uh, because uh, it, in the book of, uh, the introduction is building. It's just building, it's building. And, and as I review in chapter one, uh, it starts out with a, a court scene and there's a trial going on. And the prosecutor is Isaiah the prophet. God is telling him to prosecute. And those who are on trial is Judah and Jerusalem. They're the defendants in the case. And the, there's a jury box with witnesses in it. Not that they're going to decide the case because God the judge decides the case. But heaven and earth are summoned to come along and be a witness to what is going down. He then turns and he makes the charge. And the charge is this. He says, the ox. The ox knows his master. And he says, and the donkey knows his master's crib. But my people do not know me. You get what I'm talking about? Al talked about it. Believed it up here, but really didn't know him. My people don't know me. They went through all their rituals and everything, but they had never internalized it and made him their Lord, or it would have changed their behavior. Because if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creature, the old is gone, the new has come, they would have acted differently. So the charge is you are a wayward, stubborn, bratty child because you know, but you don't do what I say. He then says, here's the evidence. You're rebellious, you're corrupt. So corrupt, he calls them Sodom. That is spiritually, they are so far from God that he should rain down brimstone and fire on them because they're doing the exact same things that the pagans did. There's no real sign that they have ever truly made the Lord the Lord of their life. He then makes a verdict, and the verdict is you're guilty, and after that, then he offers a pardon. He says, all you have to do is repent, wash, cleanse yourself, make yourself clean, repent. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. He offers the pardon, but you have to receive the pardon. Even in the United States of America, the president or the governor can offer a pardon, but if you reject it, it's not valid. <laughs> God has done everything we for the pardon. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though your sins be like crimson, they shall be just like wool. He's offering you to have your sins washed away and be clean if you will just take him up on his offer of a pardon. If you don't, he says in the first chapter, you are like kindling wood. Not only are you like kindling wood, but what you do is like a spark that ignites yourself on fire. You condemn yourself. We move then to chapter 2, and it's the same beginning, as the same as the first chapter. He said, this is what Isaiah saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He says, in the last days of Israel and Jerusalem. So he's going down through the tunnel of time. And he's looking beyond the church age. He's looking beyond the rapture. He's looking towards that, that period of tribulation that follows when the church is God and re, God resumes his dealing with his old covenant people, Israel. And, and he, he's looking to the time when Christ will return and he will set up a kingdom that lasts for a thousand years according to Revelation chapter 20 where it's mentioned six times. It's a thousand years long. He's looking... But then he backs up and he says, I, I, I want to focus on that dark period. And he's looking at that tribulation period that takes place when Jesus Christ returns to the earth and takes the church out of the world and there's a dark period such as never was or ever shall be again, according to Isaiah. We move to the next chapter, chapter 3. That was last week we looked at chapter 3. He says, there is an intervention in, by the judge with judgment. He starts taking away, he takes away the necessary things in life, and we enumerated that and kind of likened it to perhaps the troubles we have in America today. And, and then he says he's going to impose some judgment on them because he's going to give them over to, if you're going to be a spoiled brat, I'm just going to let you have what you want and see where it goes. And he judges them in that way. He interjects judgment because the text says he stands up and he judges and then it goes on and says, well, there's some implications 
He begins naming them that he's judging. He's judging the leaders in Israel. He's judging the women in Israel. He's judging the men in Israel. It comes right down to every individual. We're all going to give an account for what we have done. But we concluded that whole thing with that one key verse in the text where it says that he separates the righteous from the unrighteous. And it's there that some believe that this next chapter should be linked right to the previous chapter. It is the shortest chapter in the book of Isaiah. It is only six verses long. And if you take the first verse that really goes with the, the, the last chapter uh, and, and the argument there, it's only five verses long. And it's about the kingdom come, thy kingdom come. Uh, let me ask, have you ever prayed that prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. He's talking about Jesus when he told the disciples, pray that, listen, I'm your king, pray that the kingdom comes. Which kingdom? This kingdom that Isaiah is talking about, that Ezekiel talks about, that, that Daniel talks about, that the prophets talk about, where, where Revelation 20 talks about. He comes to the earth and he sets up a kingdom where righteousness and holiness rules for a thousand years. That's what this chapter is about, the coming kingdom. He's looking, he says, in the last days. The last days technically began when Jesus arrived. Because Isaiah in chapter 9 verse 6 is going to talk about a child that comes. In chapter 7 verse 14, a virgin's going to have a son. In chapter 9 verse 6, there's going to be a son whose name is called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. He's going to rule he sees the coming of the Messiah, and he also sees the first coming of Messiah, that he goes to the cross and he's going to die. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've led everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. This son is going to be the substitute that takes away the sin of the world. So he sees him in his first coming, but he also sees in Isaiah him coming a second time. And when he comes the second time, it's recorded in Revelation 19, a, a parallel passage, that he comes riding on a white horse. He's no longer a little tiny uh, lamb that's slain, but he is, he is the victorious, conquering king of kings and lord of lords. He comes with a great army, and he is going to bring judgment to the nations. And at that point, we find that he's going to set up a kingdom that lasts for a thousand years. So in chapter 2, he said, in the last days, and 4-2, he says, in that day, in that time I'm talking about, when Messiah comes and he rules, he has skipped the whole church age here, because it's not written in the Old Testament, it's a revelation in the New Testament. Jesus said, I will build my church, it was future, it did not ever exist until the future. Acts chapter 2, it started, at the rapture it will be gone, but he says, in the last days of Israel, in the time of the kingdom, it's going to be like this. And we move to Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord. Notice the word branch is capitalized. In that day, the branch of the Lord. The Lord is capitalized too, every letter, because that is the word Jehovah, or that is the word Yahweh. It is the branch of Yahweh, and this branch is a title for Messiah the king of Israel that was to come. I know that by skimming through the Bible and picking up other references to the branch. When, when I go to chapter 11 of Isaiah, he says this, that this branch, he is the shoot king. A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was King David's father. And you know the story. Jesse uh, had multiple sons. And when Samuel came to anoint one, he brought his oldest son, and Samuel said, not him. And he brought another son, oh, not him. And I think he goes down through like 11 of them, oh, not him. And he said, finally, finally, he gets down and he says, hey, you got any more sons? <laughs> Could you imagine today, you prayed out 11 kids, <laughs> and you say, wait a minute, you got any more? <laughs> So he said, well, I got this little guy. He said, just a ruddy lad. He's out taking care of the sheep. And, and they bring him before him, and they anoint him as king. Anoint David as king. 
Listen. A shoot is going to come from the stump of Jesse. Jesse, who's had all these sons, has this one son that is king, but something happens to the kingdom because he, it's a stump. The tree or the line has been cut off. If you're familiar with your Bible and you've read the historical, the political book of the Old Testament, the book of the kings, it's all politics. You look at the Chronicles, and the Chronicles is the priestly interpretation of what happened in the kings. It's, it's giving you a spiritual application why the politics were happening the way they were happening. But you got this connection. But if you go into the book of, uh, of either one, the kings or Chronicle, and you look to the last king of Israel, his name is Zedekiah. And Zedekiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And he sent the Babylonians, and the Babylonians conquered him and Jerusalem and cut off the line of the kings. The stump, the tree had fallen, the stump was left. It is a terrible graphic depiction. Zedekiah watches as they kill his two sons and then they put out his eyes and they take him away into captivity. The stump is all that's left. They go into captivity for 70 years and after 70 years there's a a remnant that returns to the land but there is no king in Israel. They wind up having a couple of governors but no king. There was no king that came down, and that's why the book of Matthew is so important. At the beginning of Matthew is a long genealogy that gives you the history of Jesus, that he is the king of the Jews. He is the branch that comes out of a line that has died. Jesus is the branch. From his root, the branch will bear fruit. He's going to come up and bear fruit. There's going to be a kingdom again. That's what he's saying. We move on and we look in Jeremiah 23, 5, and we find that it is a Davidic king in the days that are coming, declares the Lord. When I raise up David, uh, to David, a righteous branch. Now I know that the branch is a Davidic descendant of David. It's not David, but a descendant of him. A king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land, in the land of Israel. Jesus is coming back. He's going to assume his role as the king, the branch, and he's going to rule in Jerusalem, in the kingdom. It's coming. It's coming. In those days, and it says in Jeremiah 33, it says, in those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. And he will do what is just and right in the land. You think things are going just and right in the land right now? Not here, not Israel, not anywhere. It will when King Jesus comes and King Jesus reigns. Zechariah adds to this. He says, listen, O high priest Joshua. Now, that's not Joshua of uh, the book of Joshua. This is much later. He's named Joshua, uh, this high priest. He says, O high priest Joshua, you, he says, and your associates seated before you, who are, are men symbolic of things to come, I am going to bring my servant the branch. Now we learn that he is a servant branch. And that's why the Bible often calls Jesus the servant. He's the servant. You see, in his first coming, he wears the crown of thorns because he's the servant of the Lord to die for us. But in his second coming, he is king of kings and lord of lords. Back into Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. It's going to be a time of the beauty of the Lord the beauty of the Lord. And glorious. There's going to be a glory in the kingdom that later he's going to talk about. There's going to be a glory in the kingdom that has never been been among the nations or in Israel. It's going to be a beautiful kingdom. He says, it's going to be a beautiful kingdom. He says, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and the glory of the survivors in Israel. He talks about survivors in Israel. What in the world have they survived? I'll tell you what they've survived. It's that dark days that he's been talking about. 
There is a period coming after the church is gone. It's going to be a tribulation time such as never was. The, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jesus called it the tribulation. And in the middle of it, he calls it the great tribulation. It's going to be a seven-year period. It's going to be a terrible, dreadful time. And he says, those who are left in Zion at the end of that time, church is gone, tribulation is coming. But those who are alive at the end of that time and who remain, they're going to face the judgment uh, of the nations, and then it says, in Jerusalem, they remain there. They will be called holy, all who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. Ooh. There's going to be a salvation that takes place. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ returning? Israel's got all the nations of the world around it, gathering, trying to seize it. And uh, Jesus arrives, and they look on him, Isaiah sa uh, or Zechariah says, they look on him who they have pierced. And the idea is they looked like, uh, back in the numbers, when, when they had been bitten with snakes, the nation and people were bitten with snakes, and, and the venom was killing them, and Moses was instructed to build a pole with a, a serpent on it and lift it up, and all who would look to it would live. And those who would not look to it, they would die from the snake bite. And the idea is they look, and the nation of Israel is going to look to Jesus and finally call him their Messiah, their Lord, their King, their God. This is the way Jesus puts it in Matthew, Matthew 25. This event, judgment of the nations. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the nations with Him, or all the angels with Him, sorry, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. Now, He's not in heavenly place for this. It's the heavenly glory that is brought to the earth, and He sits on a throne according to Zechariah chapter 9, that he's going to sit as a king and a priest upon the throne. It says he is going to then, all the nations will be gathered before him. Oh, it's going to be time all these nations gather before him. And then he says, as they're all gathered before him, he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The word judge simply means to divide. He's judging the nations. He's dividing. He's separating. In fact, the text tells us he's separating. On the right, he's putting all the sheep. On the left, he is putting all the goats. And then the text tells us, Jesus says, the king shall say to those on his right, the sheep, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I was a stranger, and you, you invited me in. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. The kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That kingdom is coming. That's what he's talking about. He said, I needed clothes, and you clothed me, and I was sick, and you, you, you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came and you visited me. And then the righteous, see, that's who they are, the sheep. He, he, God divides between the righteous and the unrighteous, the sheep and the goats. He says, and the righteous, the sheep will answer, Lord, when did we feed you? When did we give you drink? When did we invite you in? When did we clothe you? When did we ever go visit you? And the Lord is going to say, the king is going to reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. How have you treated the people of God? Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. They had to be born. These sheep that he's talking about, they're the ones that looked on Jesus, whom they pierced and believed and were born again. They're the ones, uh, they're the ones who are going into the kingdom because they have had their hearts changed and they, they treated the people of God correctly. Then the king says, he will say to those on his left, 
Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Honest to goodness, you don't hear very much hellfire brimstone preaching today, do you? Everybody's got ears that they just want to have them tickled, but say, make me feel good. Don't, don't make me feel any conviction here that I might be on the wrong path. Jesus is the one who says here, those who don't believe in him, they'll depart and they're cursed. They're going to eternal fire. That was prepared really for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for them. But since they have aligned themselves with Satan, with Satan you shall go. Wow. He says, for you gave me nothing to eat, nothing to drink. You did not invite me in. You did not clothe me. You did not look after me. And then they say, but Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? Needing clothes or sick or in prison? And you did not help and did not help you. And then he said to them, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Wow. You see, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do not love the Lord with all your heart, you will not love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. They, and then he wraps it up. Jesus wraps it up. He says, they will go away to eternal punishment. And he says, but the righteous. You see, God always separates the just from the unjust, the righteous from the unrighteous, but the righteous to eternal life. They go into the kingdom. The kingdom is a thousand-year prelude to the eternal state, the eternal day, the eternal time of heaven with God, and to be in heaven with God. It's at this point that we jump back to Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. The previous chapter talked a, a long description of how bad the women were. And he says here, but in that day, before you go into the kingdom, it's only righteousness, only those born again are going to be able to enter the kingdom. He will cleanse the bloodstains all your murderous activities. Remember what Jesus said? If you are angry with your brother, it's as if you have killed him, you've murdered him. He he is going to wash away all of our sins. And he says, from Jerusalem, by a spirit of judgment. The word judgment means to divide. He said, I'm going to divide before I allow them to go into into the, the kingdom and the unrighteous are not going in. And a spirit of fire. The fire is the flames that removes the dross from the gold. And it's all going to be refined. There's going to be a cleansing in the coming kingdom before it happens. And then we are told a little bit about the kingdom itself. And the Lord will create. The word create, same same word as in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. Created. Same exact word, bara. So the Lord is going to create out of nothing over all of Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the mountain upon which the holy city Jerusalem is. Primarily it's that region where the temple resides. And this is kind of the temple of the uh, model of the temple in, in uh, the day of Herod. It is not the future temple. You want to get a picture of it? You read Ezekiel 40 to the end, 48. And there's a graphic description of the future coming temple. He says, the Lord will create over the Mount Zion and over all those who assemble there. All the people who are coming to the Lord, and we saw in the previous chapters, that all the nations of the earth are going to come and worship the Lord there. And I put like a half of the 300 or so nations on the planet, their flags flying in into the temple area. And he says, oh, he says, the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day. Now that immediately, if you've read your Bible, should trigger, boom, this has happened before. Back in the wilderness, when the the Israelites left Egypt and went down to Sinai, they erected a tabernacle, a tent, 
And then the glory cloud of the Lord was over it by day. That glory cloud stuck around. And listen, even down to the day when, when Solomon built the temple, the glory cloud came and it was over it. It was a pillar of cloud by day. Now watch what the text says. So now we got this smoke over, over all of Zion. N not just the temple, over all of Mount Zion. A and he says, and a glowing of flame of fire by night. Now, now this just triggers it. This is what happened to the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Every day they would go and they would see that pillar of cloud by day and that would instantaneously, at, at, as the day turned to night, Twilight, it would turn into a pillar of fire. And that cloud led them through the whole wilderness. When that cloud would move off the tabernacle, they'd pack up tent and follow it. And they were following it because when, when that cl cloud stopped, they'd erect the, the tabernacle underneath it because God was leading them and, and God was in that. That same pillar of, of, of cloud and, and pillar of fire, it, when they left left Egypt, it stood between the Egyptians who pursued them and the, and the Israelites that were at the border of the Red Sea, and that pillar of cloud w was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that protected them from the oncoming Egyptians. Wow. The kingdom is going to have a glory return to it. A glory return to it. And he says, and over all the glory. Now, th this passage is calling that Cloud of, 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 during the day for a shadow and fire for at night is calling that cloud the glory, the glory. It's an effulgence of radiant glory that's going to be over Mount Zion in the kingdom. And then he says, now over all the glory will be a canopy, a canopy. Now, I don't know, we had a canopy here not too long ago. We set it up so everybody could be under it from the sun, right? Uh, while we ate for our, our big event uh, with the, the movie night and all that that was going on, the family festival, we put up a, 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 a canopy. But there's going to be a canopy over the glory, over the city of Jerusalem in the coming kingdom uh, that we've all been praying, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. He adds to that, and it will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day. Now, I don't know if that canopy is going to be visible or invisible. I don't know if it's going to be more like a dome. I don't, I don't know. I just know that it's going to be there, and it's going to be for protection a shade from the heat of the day. And he goes on and he says, a refuge and hiding place from the storm and the rain. It's going to be a protective barrier over all of Mount Zion. The kingdom's protection. What a contrast. From chapter 3 last week to chapter 4 this week. In chapter 3, it focused on all the corruptions of the leaders and the men and the women in Israel. Chapter 4 is about the righteous king. Chapter 3, he had likened everything to Sodom. In chapter 4, he likens it to paradise. To paradise. In chapter 3, he, he likens all these corrupt leaders uh, to abusing people all the people are abused but in chapter four all the people are protected wow in chapter three there's a shameful fall of the nation israel and in chapter four there's the glory of god in the land in chapter three their sinfulness is all exposed in chapter four it is all washed away. Wow. In chapter 3, it's all about condemnation. And in chapter 4, it's all about salvation. Salvation. Where is all this leading? Here's where it's leading. Here's the point. King Jesus changes everything. King Jesus changes everything. The day I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart, my life, everything changed in my life. 
Al is telling you the same story. The day Jesus Christ actually entered into his life, into his heart, not just his head, into his heart, it changed everything. Because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, the old is gone, the new has come, you are a different person. King Jesus changes everything. So you need King Jesus now. You need to be born again now. For as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the children of God. Listen, you need him now, and you're going to need him later. <laughs> because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. He changes everything. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I don't know because I'm not like you. I can't look on the hearts of everyone here. You've said you search the hearts of man. Your eyes run to and fro through the whole earth. You don't look on the outward appearance. You look on the heart. And right now you know which heart has accepted Jesus and those who have not. We look on the outward appearance. We see what they do. And we judge from what we see. You judge from what you see on the inside. We judge on the outside. And we look at the outward and what they are doing and we say, the good person, they must know the Lord, but Lord, we don't see the heart. You see the heart. So as you're searching now, I pray that your spirit would convict the heart. Convict the person who does not know you. Say, you know, you really don't know me. Put your faith in me right now. And I pray, Lord, with that prompting from the Spirit of God, they'll pray something so simple. Say, Lord, I'm a dreadful sinner too. Save me from my sins. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You've said that, Lord. We hold you to your word. For many of us, uh, we look at this passage and say, you know what, there's light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Life is tough right now, but I know a better day is coming. I'm going to be with Jesus. When the rapture takes place, it says we will ever be with the Lord. Wherever he is, when he's in heaven, we're in heaven. When he's on earth reigning, we're here reigning with him. Wherever he goes, we go. We are the bride of Christ by his side. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word to tell us that there's light at the end of our tunnel. Great days are ahead. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.